Welcome back to our weekly question show. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you're watching any video across the entire channel, go ahead, just type in your question. I'll gather them all up here and answer them. D is is ace. Why would we put space telescopes out of range? Hubble would have failed if they did that. This question is in response to the Rise of the Super Telescopes episode that I did talking about James Webb and the fact that the James Webb Space Telescope is, is going to be going out to the L2 Earth-Sun Lagrange point, which is you know, what, 2 million kilometers away from Earth, so very far away from Earth. And, the, and once it's there, it's going to be in this relatively stable place, but it's going to be using up its fuel and it's going to last for about 10 years and then it's going to drift away and not be a usable telescope anymore. And so the question people are like, why, when we look at how long Hubble's been going and they've been repairing it, why would they make a, an even more powerful telescope like James Webb and, and have it have such a short lifetime? Now 10 years is a long time. And you've got to kind of think about all of the things that are going on all at the same time. So the first thing is, is that if you want to put a space telescope like James Webb in a place that it can last the longest period of time with the least amount of fuel used, the L2 Lagrange point is like the most stable place that you can go. It's even more usable than if you wanted to put up, say, in a geostationary orbit. So if you want it to remain with the minimum amount of fuel for the longest period of time, L2 is your place. Now that said, right now the United States and the world has no spacecraft capable, like a piloted spacecraft capable of docking with something at L2 and repairing it and upgrading it and that kind of thing. So I'm sure the mission planners were like, well maybe we could make a telescope that is that is upgradable and maintainable, but when they looked at sort of the costs and the complexities and the risks involved to sending astronauts that far out to be able to do that, they just decided we've got to go with a telescope that, that has these risks that it could fail and it might not deploy properly and it might not be able to be used, but at least we'll get a telescope out there. I think future telescopes as the infrastructure of NASA and other space agencies comes together and you actually can have humans like on the Orion capsule and things like that be able to go to these further orbits, then you might get large telescopes like Louvoir actually be human serviceable. But in the short period of time, we're going to be in this time when all these telescopes are going to go up and there's no way to service them like we did with Hubble. Van Theo. Please answer my question. Why do humans want to know if aliens still exist and what is the point in doing it? I'm not sure why you're watching uh, videos on a channel all about space and astronomy and aliens and stuff. Clearly you're fascinated by it because you watched the video and you made a comment. Is there a hummingbird right behind <laughs> me again? Yeah. But uh, it, uh, I mean, I feel like that, like it's about curiosity, right? Right now, we human beings and the all life on Earth, this is the only place that we know there's life in the entire universe. We don't know if there's life on Mars, if there's life on Europa or Enceladus, and we definitely don't know if there's life on any other star and any other planet in the entire universe. We just don't know. It is like the most fundamental question that human beings can ask is, are we alone in the universe? And I want to know the answer. And I think all the people watching this channel want to know the answer. And I'm kind of amazed that you don't want to know the answer. Really? If I had an envelope and in it it said the answer to whether or not there were aliens in the universe and I gave that envelope, you wouldn't want to open it up and peek and find out what the answer is? That's curiosity. That's what we have and we want to know. And the only way to know is to find out is to go and look. And that's why we do it. Chad Glazier. With Earth-based telescopes negating the effects of the atmosphere with adaptive optics, why do we need space-based telescopes? It seems like the longevity, cost, upgradability, and maintenance of the Earth-based telescopes would be a better long-term investment. I think there's two parts to this answer. You're exactly right. I think that in recent times, the capability of the ground-based telescopes, when they have these adaptive optics where they, you know, they shoot these laser beams up and they, they create this artificial star and then they warp the mirror shape to adapt to the atmospheric distortions and they can produce images that are almost as crisp and clear as if the telescope was in space. It's a dynamic, it's a dynamic, is that even a word? It's an enormous leap 
uh, step forward in capabilities of what astronomers can do. And it has is, is enabled this whole class of super telescopes that I talked about in the last couple of episodes. That's amazing. But there are wavelengths of light that just don't make it from space to Earth. The gamma rays and x-rays, you need to have a telescope out in space. There's wavelengths of infrared that you just can't see here on the Earth's surface. So that's one of the main reasons is that you know, if you need to have your telescope cool down to just a few degrees above absolute zero, the best place to do it is out in space. So, there's, so that's, that's the simple answer, right? And then the more complex answer is that even though you can make these great big telescopes here on Earth, you can make even better telescopes out in space and they'll be more sensitive and more capable. And then the other thing is that these telescopes can be pointed at one object, one location, and be rock steady. They don't care about atmosphere, they don't care about weather, they don't care about viewing conditions. They can point at some target for hours, days, weeks, months, and just get these observations. So there's value to ground-based telescopes and there's value to space-based telescopes. And I think we're going to see more and more of both get built. And that's cool with me. Brendan Stidham. Hey Brazer, do you think it would be possible for the average person to visit space within our lifetime? By average, I mean an everyday guy or gal working a normal 9 to 5. If so, can you cite some of the best prospects for this? Now I'm going to assume that you're not talking about like space tourism where you get in a Blue Origins rocket and you go up to the edge of space and then you float around for a couple of minutes and then you come back down to Earth. Like You want to go to orbit and you want to go to some hotel and you want to hang out there for a week and then come back home. And I think the short answer is no. That even for the next many decades, I think the cost of going to space is going to be outrageous for the regular person. Like right now it's, what, 20, 30 million dollars for someone to go to the International Space Station. Uh, maybe it'll come down to say a million? couple of million when SpaceX really gets going and they've got their Dragon capsule and their, you know, so, so that's sort of your best bet. Now, I know that, that Elon Musk with the Mars colonization efforts is hoping to get those costs down to say a couple of hundred thousand dollars. So you're looking at say the price of a house to go to space or to colonize, to colonize Mars. So I think that's what you're going to be looking at is, is if you're willing to save up several hundred thousand dollars, you'll get a shot at, at going to space. I don't see it going lower than that for many, many decades. Flyboys, what do you think is the best type of propulsion to get us to Mars and other places around the solar system? Right now, the sort of the entire Earth-based fleet of rockets is all based on this idea of chemical rockets. Like it's just the entire infrastructure is chemical rockets. The even SpaceX, which is ahead of the curve in what they're doing, they're using chemical rockets. So I think you know, what would I prefer things to be? There are some more advanced, more interesting kinds of of space propulsion, maybe like there's nuclear rockets, which have a much higher kind of thrust, could get you to Mars a lot more quickly. But sort of the development on that stopped back in like the 70s, I think, 60s, 70s. There are ion engines, which can get you going very quickly, but uh, you know, you just need to have, and you don't require a lot of fuel, and they can go, you know, your maximum speed. They don't give you a lot of thrust, but they give you a much higher top velocity. Those are really cool. I think that I would like us to crack solar sails and light propulsion that would be connected with solar sails. So you can imagine some solar sail gets launched from Earth, un unfurls the sails, and then gets hit with some kind of laser to accelerate it or the light from the sun. Because then you can kind of imagine a sort of future civilization, or future humans, where we can sort of more easily, more inexpensively move around the solar system. That would be my preference. So I think if I could pick one kind of propulsion system that I would like us to sort of double down on and really try to figure out, it would be solar sails, light propulsion, things like that. And in fact, like the Planetary Society believes that too. They are, they've got their own private uh, light or solar sail a prototype that they've been working on and they and have they're gonna I don't know if they've launched it by now anyway they've launched prototypes and are working towards testing out this idea to be a way of exploring the solar system Alex 
Oh, as far as ensuring the survival of humanity, would it be better to colonize Mars or the bottom of the Earth's oceans? The problem with colonizing the bottom of the Earth's oceans, well, one, it's incredibly difficult, right? Like the pressure to try and colonize there would be very complicated, require tremendous hardware capabilities, things like that. Not to mention trying to get to and from there. That said, it's, you know, it's on Earth. And so it still sort of suffers from the existential crises that human beings suffer from. What if there's a nuclear war? What if the AIs rise and take over and, you know, and they go down and, and turn the people in the habitats at the bottom of the oceans into computers as well? So I think that to truly uh, get humans to a place that's safe, that's separate from Earth, you do need to go somewhere else. I'm not sure if Mars is the right place to go, maybe the moon is a better place, or maybe just space itself is a better place for us to colonize. Bottom line is that I think the point of making a separate life for human beings is you have to be off planet Earth. But I think something that's really interesting to me is just how hostile Mars is. I don't think the people who are signing up to go and colonize Mars really understand what a nasty place that planet is. That, that if you want to know like just a fraction of the suffering you're going to go through, go and try to live in the Arctic or in Antarctica where it's cold and there's no, not much plants and it's, you've got to struggle to survive and that's still so much more hospitable than Mars where you can just like go outside and breathe the air. And so that's, I highly recommend that. If people want to like think they want to colonize Mars, go spend some, a couple of years in the Arctic and see if you still like it. Aaron Papellis. Why can't a level two society turn heat into energy, into iron and other materials to build with? If I understand your question correctly, you're wondering some advanced civilization, like a type two civilization, couldn't they just turn energy into matter, matter into energy and be able to have the kinds of elements that they require? And I guess theoretically it's possible. We can do this today. You can go to a particle accelerator like CERN. You can smash particles together and you can create atoms that have, you know, that are heavier. And so in theory, you can imagine some super advanced civilization, you know, running their particle accelerator and building up gold atom by atom. But the problem is it's just incredibly energy intensive, very expensive. I can't imagine a time that it ever would be feasible and reasonably priced for us to do that. So it's just, it's just too expensive. It's just too time consuming, just too much energy to be able to do that. Peter Crisp, sci-fi often has people blowing up stars, but are there any realistic theoretical ways to blow up a star that could actually be built in the next century or so? No way. Not at all. The, you know, when they have these like soup, these shows or books and stuff about where they blow up a star, there's some magic hand wavy way that they make a star have undergo some kind of catastrophic uh, detonation. But the reality is, is that if you want to make a star explode, all you have to do is turn the sun into the kind of star that will explode. And the way you would do that is to add mass to it. So. Right now we've got one solar mass. If you add say another eight or nine suns to the sun, then you'll get sort of a, something that will explode as a supernova in about a million years. If that's too slow for you, then maybe give it 50, 100 times the mass of the sun. But in order to do that, you've got to find 50 more suns, 100 more suns, move them to the sun and mash them together. And then you would get a star that would blow up as a supernova in a few hundred thousand years. So still, there's just no fast way and there's no way within a century. Now, of course, anyone who says that anything is impossible is wrong. So, so maybe I'll be wrong. Fluffy Snowcap. How can you find your questions on any video? I said at the beginning, go ahead, post your questions. I read all the questions that are put on the YouTube videos and then I gather them up and I answer them here. I know you're used to YouTubers never reading your questions and never commenting, but this is a different place. And I really try to get in there and converse with you guys and answer people's questions. So that's how it works. I see all the questions and I try to gather as many of them up as I can and answer them here. Robert Jones. Can we not theoretically create a black hole and what are the pros and cons of doing so? 
There is actually a experiment in the works with the Large Hadron Collider to create an artificial black hole. And the way they will do that is they will smash particles together with such force that they will sort of crush into this incredibly dense object. And if everything's done right, it'll collapse into a black hole. Now, momentarily after, like before it even hits the ground, it will have evaporated with Hawking radiation into a little blast of energy. And the only way that you'll know that it even happened is because you get that little blast of energy. And so uh, what are the pros and cons? There aren't really any pros and cons. Pro, the pro is that you find out that, that black holes exist, that black holes evaporate, and, and Stephen Hawking gets his Nobel Prize. The con, well, some people's cons think that you know one of the problems is that you would then have this black hole that would fall into the earth and it would gobble up the earth from the inside out but but sort of the theory that predicts that a black hole should be created is also the theory that explains that it will evaporate again so there's not a lot of people that think there's any real risk of producing these black holes inside the large hadron collider oxford flossier okay question why is the moon eventually going to break free of the earth's gravity while other moons like mars are eventually going to crash inwards We've done a bunch of videos about this, but and I've, I'll, I've, I think I linked to you in the in the comments. But here's the short answer, right? Is that with the Earth and the Moon, the Earth is not actually a perfect sphere. It actually kind of has lumps and and such, and the Moon sort of squishes the Earth. And what happens is that that causes like handles, like handles, gravity handles that the Moon grabs onto. And over time, these gravity handles are slowing down the rotation of the Earth. You can kind of imagine as the, as the Earth turns, the Moon sort of grabs onto one chunk of the Earth and kind of slows it down a little bit. And to conserve the overall momentum in the system, the Moon has to drift further away. But in a situation like Mars, where Phobos is closer to Mars than the length of its day. In other words, you know, Phobos takes just a few hours to go around m Mars in compared to how long it takes for Mars to turn once on its axis. You get the opposite situation. So Phobos is actually speeding up. It's grabbing those little gravity handles on Mars and speeding up the rotation of Mars. And to maintain the overall momentum in the system, the orbit of Phobos is going down. And over time, Phobos is going to crash into it. So here's the rule. If a planet's moon goes around the planet slower than it takes the planet to turn once on its axis, then the moon will drift further away. If the moon is closer, or if the moon orbits faster than it takes the planet to turn, then the moon is going to spiral inward and crash. And that's the difference. Jamie McLaughlin. Hey Fraser, I'm visiting Orlando in November. What do you think of the chances of me seeing a launch from the Kennedy Space Center between the 1st and the 17th when I'm there? Awesome trip, Jamie. I did a very similar thing and got a chance to watch my first rocket launch. It's, it's, I, I want people to understand, I took this question because it's actually super easy to watch a rocket launch. Now a bunch of you who live in this area, you've seen a ton of them, but for the rest of us, we've never seen a rocket launch. But in fact, you can do a search, just Google search, Cape Canaveral launch schedule. And you'll find out when a bunch of launches are gonna be happening. You'll see some launches are well known within the next couple of months, and then after that, the, the actual launch times are fairly loose. All you have to do is book a hotel in Cocoa Beach, which is a really nice beach in, in Florida that has a great view of the Cape Canaveral launch facility. With some hotels, you can literally just sit on your balcony and watch the rocket go off. Pick a time when you can see that a rocket is gonna be happening. It's not that expensive to fly out to Orlando and then rent a car and stay in one of these hotels and watch a rocket launch with your own eyeballs. I highly recommend it. It's super fun, not that difficult, and it's not like you have to go on some great journey to do it, unless you live halfway around the world. But for, for most of you who live in the US and Canada, it's a pretty cool vacation to do. So if you're thinking of something fun to do with the family, or you wanna sort of add another experience to your bucket list, I highly recommend it. Okay, that's it your questions, my answers. Thanks to everybody who put in all of your questions. We had lots and lots of great questions this week. As always, I'll grab them up and answer them here.